Thank you so much. Good evening. The greatest works of the greatest artists excite not only admiration and fascination, uh, study and appreciation, but also uh, love, so that the lover feels uh, the desire to merge with the object, to be with the object, to spend his or her life in and surrounded by this object, not to let it go, to feel that something has been addressed directly from the past or the present, but in this case from a very distant past, directly to oneself, speaking uh, to one's innermost feelings. And that is perhaps most powerful, for me at least, in the works of the two writers uh, that we are encountering tonight, Shakespeare and Montaigne. They're uh, peculiar among the great writers from the past and exciting something much, much more, uh, much deeper than the ordinary connection, so that even uh, serious adults have felt that they've wanted to spend their lives uh, thinking about uh, these amazing uh, creatures. And yet they're, even though they've reached out and touched us and continue to do so, they're startlingly different. Though they lived in the same century, and as we'll see, they interacted in a fascinating way. Uh, one obviously uh, was French, the other in English, so they have two different linguistic worlds. One wrote uh, prose essays, casual, apparently formless essays. Uh, one wrote uh, plays and poems, including some of the most uh, structurally complex devices created by human beings, namely those sonnets. One uh, was deeply learned. Montaigne's first language actually was Latin because of slightly crazy father. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare uh, notoriously had, at least in Ben Jonson's account, small Latin and less Greek, though he had actually a hell of a lot of Latin compared with most of us. Uh, one was a, an aristocrat who lived in a grand uh, house that can still visit in France. The other was a middle class fellow from a provincial town. You can also visit his house, uh, <laughs> but it's more modest. Uh, and perhaps above all, one was perhaps the most open, the most public writer of his time, uh, and possibly of all times, the most directly open, the most willing to show himself, and the other was probably the most hidden of the great writers uh, in the world, the one who's hardest to locate, even when he seems to be speaking more or less directly, as famously in the sonnets, you haven't a clue whether you're actually encountering that particular human being speaking directly. He was very good at hiding uh, and, at, among other things, staying out of jail. Uh, <laughs> and he needed to worry about that because he wasn't protected by his social position, but he also seems to have had the temperament uh, to keep himself hidden. Montaigne was born in 1533. He was the son of the third son. He had two older brothers. Uh, of a son of Pierre Equem and Antoinette de Loup, Lopez. Uh, Pierre Equem's uh, grandfather had made an enormous amount of money and had, uh, in the wine trade, basically, and had bought uh, a chateau and a title of nobility. Uh, Montaigne's mother, Antoinette de Loup, was from a Jewish family, uh, f uh, but that had converted, Spanish family that had converted uh, to Catholicism. Uh, the father was wealthy, but had served as the mayor of Bordeaux. And uh, Montaigne, after his two older brothers had died young, and Montaigne had uh, become the heir, uh, also launched himself into French public affairs. But in 1571, at the age of 38 years old, he formally retired from the very busy, uh, engaged, and often tumultuous life uh, that he had followed. Uh, he withdrew, though by no means as completely as he claimed he withdrew, uh, from the world of affairs and to his famous tower, uh, where he had his library, uh, where he had, could look out on his fields uh, and think and write, write his essays. And in 1580, at the age of 47, he published uh, the first two volumes uh, of these essays. Shakespeare was born some 20 years later, 1564, 
His father had also been the equivalent of the mayor, but of a much uh, less significant town, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon. The father had some wealth, but when Shakespeare was about 13, the father lost almost all his wealth and his social position. Shakespeare uh, did not go to university. Uh, he lived at a much lower social scale and without claims to nobility or even to gentility, though later in uh, Shakespeare's life, after he had made some money, he saw to it to make sure that his father would receive a claim, <laughs> uh, be able to claim a gentle status. These two figures were, in effect, brought together. Shakespeare knew French already. We know that Shakespeare lived with a Huguenot family uh, in London, French Huguenot family, and we know because some of you will know there's a, actually a scene in French that Shakespeare at least uh, possibly, probably wrote, a rather funny and even obscene scene uh, <laughs> that Shakespeare wrote in uh, Henry V. Uh, but we know from scholar, scholarly studies of Shakespeare that his encounter with uh, Montaigne was in English uh, through the translation of John Florio. And my friend, uh, collaborator, Barnett Professor Peter Platt, is a Florio expert and helped uh, centrally create this volume and, and wrote the extremely fascinating account of Florio in uh, our new volume. Florio was uh, slightly, was 20 years uh, younger than Montaigne, but uh, 10 years older than Shakespeare, born in 1553, uh, 12 years older. Uh, he was uh, born in London uh, of Italian parents. He was the son of someone named Michelangelo Florio, who had started off his life as a Franciscan, uh, but decided this was not for him, uh, became a Protestant, fled to London, married an English woman. Uh, then when Mary Tudor, the Catholic monarch, came to power, the Florios fled, uh, as they had to do, fled uh, London, fled England, went to Strasbourg, and then finally settled in Solio uh, in Switzerland. I probably shouldn't say this because I should keep it a secret, but Solio is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, it's an unbelievably wonderful uh, village in Switzerland where uh, Florio's father was buried. But John Florio, his son, came back to England, attended Oxford, uh, and made his way in the world, becoming in the early 1590s the tutor to the immensely wealthy Henry Risley, the Earl of Southampton, about which about whom we'll hear a little bit more. And as we, in fact, start uh, this evening, uh, we'll start with the dedication, the dedicatory letter that Shakespeare wrote to the Earl of Southampton when he published in 1594 uh, his, uh, not fair to call it quasi-pornographic, but his peculiar poem, The Rape of Lucrece. Uh, he had already written the year before and published and dedicated to Southampton a quite erotic poem, uh, Venus and Adonis. Uh, that poem had done extremely well, evidently, not, and Southampton himself must have given Shakespeare quite a bit for it, or at least one assumes that, sometimes thought that Southampton actually gave Shakespeare the money he needed to have a stake in buying a uh, share of the playing company. The playing companies, when Shakespeare wrote these uh, two poems were dormant because there was plague in London and the official authorities uh, <coughs> shut down the theaters till the plague uh, ended. One of the few intelligent things probably that those officials did, uh, <laughs> though they did it in this case not because of epidemiological concerns, but because they thought God must be giving the plague because he hated the theater. Uh, in any case, uh, Shakespeare in 1594 uh, published, having published one erotic poem, published a second one dedicated to uh, Henry Risley, and we'll hear sh the tone, the peculiar tone that Shakespeare takes. You can decide for yourself what you make of it. And we'll set it against uh, the manner in which Montaigne wrote his letter to the reader uh, in his uh, <coughs> essays, a letter with uh, its cheerful acknowledgement of his imperfections, his uh, saucy indifference to what the reader makes of these imperfections, and above all, his startling desire, so unlike Shakespeare, to present himself, if he possibly could, completely naked. <coughs> to the Right Honorable Henry Risley, 
Earl of Southampton and Baron of Titchfield. The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end, whereof this pamphlet, without beginning, is but a superfluous moiety. The warrant I have of your honorable disposition, not the worth of my untutored lines, makes it assured of the acceptance. What I have done is yours. What I have to do is yours. Being part in all I have <coughs> devoted yours. Were my worth greater, my duty would show greater. Meantime, as it is, it is bound to your lordship, to whom I wish long life still lengthened with all happiness. Your lordship's in all duty, William Shakespeare. <coughs> The author to the reader. Reader, lo here a well-meaning book. It doth at the first entrance forewarn thee that in contriving the same I have proposed unto myself no other than a familiar and private end. I have no respect or consideration at all, either to thy service or to my glory. My forces are not capable of any such design. Had my intention been to forestall and purchase the world's opinion and favor, I would surely have adorned myself more quaintly, or kept a more grave and solemn march. I desire therein to be delineated in mine own genuine, simple, and ordinary fashion, without contention, art, or study, for it is myself I portray. My imperfections shall thus be read to the life, and my natural form discerned, so far forth as public reverence hath permitted me. For if my fortune had been to have lived among those nations which yet are said to live under the sweet liberty of nature's first and uncorrupted laws, I assure thee I would most willingly have portrayed myself fully and naked. <laughs> thus, gentle reader, myself am the groundwork of my book. It is then no reason thou shouldst employ thy time about so frivolous and vain a subject. Therefore, farewell. <laughs> I think we can feel, and indeed I think when Shakespeare read those words, he felt uh, very intensely what it meant uh, to be a French aristocrat, an eccentric one to be sure. Uh, and what it felt to be a middle-class actor trying to please an enormously wealthy and capricious nobleman. And we'll see those class issues uh, again and again, I think, surface uh, in different ways uh, this evening. Both Shakespeare and Montaigne uh, were sensitive to the currents, the forces in the intellectual life, but also in the spiritual and emotional life world of the Renaissance, and above all, to the ways in which uh, people in the 15th and 16th century were thinking more and more uh, of the universe centered uh, not, or not only on certain metaphysical rituals in relation to an absent God, but to the figure of the human, to the human being as the measure of all things. Both Shakespeare and Montaigne had rather complex accounts of what humans were. Whenever Montaigne says he's just a simple fellow, you know that he's lying. Uh, but Montaigne uh, perhaps expressed his views most uh, clearly and even startlingly uh, in his remarkable late essay uh, of repenting, in which, in effect, he refuses to repent, something almost unheard of. Uh, in the 16th century, when you were expected uh, to go through the usual uh, claims uh, that you were a prodigal, finally, uh, only now returning uh, uh, as a reformed sinner to uh, your uh, proper spiritual condition. Uh, Montaigne, instead, says he wants to portray himself as he actually is, uh, as a particular person, not as a general figure, but as a particular person who should be otherwise, but this is the way he is. And 
The lines will constantly change. He wants to do a self-portrait, but the, an unheard of self-portrait in which the lines are constantly moving and changing because everything he says moves. The world is, by definition, unstable, radically unstable, and even things that look uh, perfectly stable, like this uh, table, are filled, not only are they moving this way, but they're filled with, ob with a uh, material that is moving, shaking, uh, in fact, even if you can't see it. And so Montaigne tries to do something that he says is unheard of to, to depict passage, not being, but passage, becoming, uh, and to propose this and to claim, as he does, as you will see, that by doing so, by representing life in all of its variegated motions and particularity, he's actually going to represent the whole of the human condition. And we'll set this against a passage from Shakespeare, from Hamlet, in which the status of the human is once again uh, at stake, but in a very different way. Uh, this is the moment in Hamlet in which uh, his school chums, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, encounter him uh, and are asking him, what's bothering him? Why is he behaving so strangely? Uh, Shakespeare has Hamlet very, very quickly divine that his friends aren't asking this question sort of randomly but have been put up to it. Uh, and then in response, he decides to, claims to confess to them what it is that he's feeling. Uh, they're trying to discover what's uh, bothering him. And of course, we know that what's bothering him is that a ghost, namely the ghost of his father, has come and told him uh, that he's been murdered by his uncle. But Hamlet gives a different answer, one that sounds like a description of abstract disillusionment and clinical depression, uh, having to do with beginning with a profound confidence in human beings and their capacities and discovering that you've lost that sense. Why, he says, uh, he doesn't know, it's just happened. And what you can immediately see in Shakespeare's game, in part in response to the kind of thing he could have encountered in Montaigne, is a peculiar element of suspicion as to whether you can believe anything that you're being told by someone who's confessing. Of repenting. Others fashion man. I repeat and represent a particular one, but ill-made and of whom were I to form anew, he should be far other than he is, but he is now made. And though the lines of my picture change and vary, yet lose they not themselves. The world runs all on wheels. All things therein move without intermission. Yea, the earth, the rocks of Caucasus, and the pyramids of Egypt, both with the public and with their own motion. Constancy itself is nothing but a languishing and wavering dance. I describe not the essence, but the passage. Not a passage from age to age, or as people reckon, from seven years to seven, but from day to day, from minute to minute. My history must be fitted to the present. I may soon change, not only fortune, but intention, whether it be that myself am other, or that I apprehend subjects by other circumstances and considerations. Howsoever I may perhaps gainsay myself, but truth, I never gainsay. I propose a mean life, without luster. Tis all one. They fasten all moral philosophy as well to a popular and private life as to one of richer stuff. Every man beareth the whole stamp of human condition. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, 
In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights, not me, nor woman either, though by your smiling you seem to say so. The world moves on wheels. Uh, Montaigne loved, embraced uh, what many of his contemporaries loathed and feared, which was the mutability of everything. Uh, and he wrote a celebrated essay uh, of the inconstancy of our actions, in which, as you will see uh, from a tiny glimpse of it, he claims that humans should be understood as chameleons. Uh, they adapt themselves to whatever place they're in. Uh, they're filled uh, with mysterious flaps and patches, as he says. They're not consistent. Uh, there's no principle of character. There's no core of self. There's only constant change. Uh, that's what it is to be human. That is what it is to write essays. Don't look for any thread that will lead through. Don't look for anything that will enable you to understand uh, who I am or who anyone else is. And if you take this principle, as I think uh, when Shakespeare grasped uh, that this was Montaigne's point, he, I think Shakespeare would have understood he couldn't have written a single play uh, on this ground. It would have been a piece of mad uh, post-modern -post drama in which nothing was consistent, no characters emerged at all, uh, but just a jumble of strange moves in one direction uh, or another without apparently uh, any purpose. Uh, but Shakespeare was interested in Montaigne's vision and in particular in that peculiar way as you'll see in the small passage we have that Montaigne uh, understands that by this principle you're also not only different from everybody else, everyone is always shifting from one thing to another, but even to yourself inwardly you are somehow estranged or distant you are an other to yourself, uh, as Montaigne uh, says. And Shakespeare plays with this in multiple ways, uh, but maybe most vividly uh, toward the end uh, of Antony and Cleopatra, uh, when Antony, who has staked everything on his love for Cleopatra, discovers uh, that he has been betrayed by her. She has fled from the great naval encounter in which uh, uh, she and her forces were going to stand next to his, and as a result, they are ruined. Uh, the whole world that he had thought to create with her is ruined, and he is collapsing not only as a principle of power, one of the triple pillars of the world, but he's collapsing as a person, he feels, and as a personality. He's experiencing in a way, uh, Montaigne was rather cheerful about the idea that you're constantly wavering and changing. Antony expresses in a way characteristic, I think deeply characteristic of Shakespeare uh, and of the play, a sense of horror and sickness uh, that he is coming apart and that the only thing left for him, uh, as he says, uh, to his very peculiarly named uh, servant, Eros, the only thing that he has left for himself is the possibility of killing himself. of the inconstancy of our actions. There is nothing I so hardly, there is nothing I so hardly believe to be in man as constancy, and nothing so easy to be found in him as inconstancy. I have often thought that even good authors do ill and take a wrong course, willfully to opinionate themselves about framing a constant and solid contexture of us. Our ordinary manner is to follow the inclination of our appetite this way and that way, in the left and on the right hand, upward and downward, according as the wind of occasions doth transport us. We never think on what we would have, but at the instant we would have it, and change as that beast that takes the color of the place wherein it is laid. What we even now proposed, we alter by and by, and presently return to our former bias. 
all is but changing, motion and inconstancy. This supple variation and easy yielding contradiction which is seen in us have made some to imagine that we had two souls. For so much as such a rough diversity cannot well sort and agree in one simple subject. Whosoever looketh narrowly about himself shall hardly see himself twice in the same state. Sometimes I give my soul one visage and sometimes another, according unto the posture or side I lay her in. All contrarieties are found in her, according to some turn or removing, and in some fashion or other, shamefast, bashful, insolent, chaste, luxurious, peevish, prattling, silent, fond, doting, laborious, nice, delicate, ingenious, slow, dull, froward, humorous, debonair, wise, ignorant, false in words, truth-speaking, both liberal, covetous, and prodigal. We are all framed of flaps and patches, and of so shapeless and diverse a contexture that every piece and every moment playeth his part. And there is as much difference found between us and ourselves as there is between ourselves and other. Eros, thou yet beholdest me. I, noble Lord. Sometimes we see a cloud that's dragonish, a vapor sometime like a bear or a lion, a towered citadel, a pendant rock, a forked mountain or blue promontory with trees upon it that nod unto the world and mock our eyes with air. Thou hast seen these signs. They are black vespers pageants. Aye, my lord. That which is now a horse, even with a thought, the rack dislimbs and makes it indistinct, as water is in water. It does, my lord. My good knave Eros, now thy captain is even such a body. Here I am, Antony, yet cannot hold this visible shape, my knave. I made these wars for Egypt and the queen, whose heart I thought I had, for she had mine, which whilst it was mine, had annexed unto it a million more now lost. She, Eros, has packed cards with Caesar and false played my glory unto an enemy's triumph. Nay, weep not, gentle Eros. There is left us ourselves to end ourselves. I suddenly realized, I should have realized this before, but uh, when Blair Brown read uh, that wonderful passage from Montaigne, you just heard from the inconstancy of our actions, that that uh, cascade of uh, adjectives, shamefast, bashful, insolent, chaste, luxurious, peevish, prattling, silent, fond, doting, laborious, is a description of Cleopatra, that it's ab of Shakespeare's Cleopatra. It's absolutely astonishing. Uh, that that uh, it's a different form of confusion, as it were, of identity, one that actually undoes Antony, but that Shakespeare has gone way out of his way to actually see if he could create a character that would have all of these uh, uh, impossibly diverse moods uh, in one, and he, uh, that he has created the single greatest, probably single greatest uh, women character in his uh, repertory. Um, it's amazing. Uh, we're shifting uh, now uh, to a different uh, aspect of our, uh, of our two great writers, and one in which there's a very clear uh, connection. 
in many of the uh, works that we've seen, there are echoes, possibilities, uh, that uh, sometimes quite striking possibilities, so much so that though Florio's translation of Montaigne didn't appear till 1603 uh, in print, it's almost certainly the case that Shakespeare had a copy of the translation uh, in uh, his hands in manuscript before. Uh, but uh, we could go on, academics love going on forever and ever about how that works. Uh, but they probably knew each other, I mean, partly through the Southampton circle uh, that Shakespeare, they were part of at the same time. Shakespeare probably did a rather unpleasant teasing of Florio, one he didn't like, uh, in the character of Holofernes, the, the pedantic schoolmaster in Love's Labor's Lost. And there are many other signs of connections between them, not always happy connections between them before 1603, but the, the moments of actual uh, demonstrable connections uh, happen a bit later. And we're going to look at one just now uh, that has to do with responses to one of the most obviously astonishing things to have happened in the 16th century, which was the, consequence, uh, the consequences of the encounter uh, with the New World. Uh, from 1492 on. In 1563, Montaigne had a weird experience. He was in Rouen, and he met three cannibals, Tupinamba Indians from uh, Brazil who had been carried back by the French expedition to France, where they lasted a very short time before they succumbed to the diseases that, uh, for which they had no uh, protection. Uh, but before they uh, died, the king did a very weird thing, uh, which was to have a I mean, the grand ceremony uh, to mark their arrival, but the peculiar nature of the ceremony is he built a little Brazilian village, folk, fake Brazilian village, sort of a Disney effect, uh, <laughs> and he staged with his soldiers a re-imagining uh, of the encounter between, first encounter between uh, the French and the Brazilian uh, cannibals. Montaigne w was amused by this or horrified by it, we don't know, but he, he wanted to talk to these people. Uh, and he found someone who could interpret for him, uh, and he, uh, or claimed he could interpret for him, uh, someone who had been on the expedition and who claimed to know some, uh, had learned some Tupanamba. And Montaigne put a series of questions to the Brazilians. And Montaigne was incredibly annoyed by the uh, translated whom he thought was a complete uh, uh, jerk uh, and incapable of doing much good. But on the other hand, Montaigne was amazed by the answers and then set his mind to work at what he had heard uh, and in effect created uh, what we call the noble savage. Uh, a, a vision of life in its absolute pure native state before it's been destroyed, the fruits that taste better, the vegetables that taste better before they've been artificially altered. It's a kind of vision, an extremely familiar kind of feeling now, of feeling uh, disgusted with what we've done uh, to nature and to the world, a, a celebration of, of these uh, creatures who live in, a, in their original pure state, and he coupled that with a sense, as he says, that I think it's, there's more barbarism in eating men alive than to feed upon them when they're dead. There's nothing so terrible about cannibalism compared with what we do, for example, in our religious wars or in our treatment of the poor. Uh, and Montaigne's, uh, Montaigne's famous and incredibly influential passage is set here against uh, Shakespeare's also remarkable depiction of the cannibal whom he calls in the uh, Shakespearean trick, Caliban. Uh, and that uh, figure uh, is part of a play in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, in which Shakespeare, if you listen carefully, you can, well, you won't hear it now, but if you listen carefully next time you go to, to uh, The Tempest, Shakespeare quotes in the figure of Gonzalo the lines that you'll hear at the end of the passage from Montaigne uh, we're uh, just about to hear about how perfect it is and so forth. And, and Shakespeare has characters mock those lines as hopelessly naive. Does he think it's naive? It's hard to say, because he has the people who mock Gonzalo's lines, who mock these lines from Montaigne, are wicked characters, Antonio and Sebastian. On the other hand, Gonzalo does seem a little naive when you actually encounter Caliban, who is not a noble savage in our sense at all, but rather filthy, 
brutal, violent, drunken, lecherous, a rapist, and altogether no good. <laughs> Of the cannibals. Now, to return to my purpose, I find, as far as I have been informed, there is nothing in that nation that is either barbarous or savage, unless men call that barbarism, which is not common to them. They are even savage, as we call those fruits, wild, which nature of herself and of her ordinary progress hath produced. Whereas, indeed, they are those which ourselves have altered by our artificial devices and diverted from their common order, we should rather term savage. In those are the true and most profitable virtues and natural properties most lively and vigorous, which in these we have bastardized, applying them to the pleasure of our corrupted taste. Those nations seem, therefore, so barbarous unto me because they have received very little fashion from human wit, and are yet near their original naturality. The laws of nature do yet command them, which are but little bastardized by ours. For me seemeth that what in those nations we see by experience doth not only exceed all the pictures wherewith licentious poesy hath proudly embellished the golden age and all her quaint inventions to feign a happy condition of man, but also the conception and desire of philosophy. It is a nation that hath no kind of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no intelligence of numbers, no name of magistrate nor of politic superiority, no use of service, of riches or of poverty, no contracts, no successions, no dividences, no occupation but idle, no respect of kindred, but common, no apparel, but natural, no manuring of lands, no use of wine, corn, or metal, the very words that import lying, falsehood, treason, dissimulation, covetousness, envy, detraction, and pardon were never heard of amongst them. Thou poisonous slave! Got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth. As wicked dew as e'er my mother brushed with raven's feather from unwholesome fen, drop on you both. A southwest blow on ye and Blister you all o'er. For this be sure, tonight thou shalt have cramps, uh, side stitches that shall pen thy breath up, urchins shall for thy vast night of work that they may work, all exercise on thee. Thou shalt be pinched as thick as honeycomb, each pinch more stinging than the bees that made them. I must eat my dinner. <laughs> this island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. Where thou camest first, thou strokest me and madest much of me. Wouldst give me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light, and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I loved thee, and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. Cursed be I that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king. And here you stymie me in this hard rock, whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. The most lying slave, who stripes may move. Not kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with human care, and lodged thee in mine own cell, till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. Oh, 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 oh. would it had been done. <laughs> thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban. Abhor it, slave, which any print of goodness wilt not take, being capable of all ill. I pitied thee, 
took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour one thing or other? When thou didst not savage know thine own meaning but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. But thy vile race, though thou didst learn, had that in which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore wast thou deservedly confined unto this rock, who hadst deserved more than a prison. You taught me language, and my profit on't is I know how to curse. <laughs> the red plague rid you for learning me your language. Hag, you seed! I think maybe most here, uh, we can feel the weird force of the encounter between uh, these two remarkable intelligences, Shakespeare's and Montaigne's, the very peculiar way in which, in this case, Shakespeare rehearses the worst possible encounter, uh, account of the natives of the New World, infinitely worse than Montaigne's idealized vision of these people who look vaguely like Greek gods uh, and march around uh, very happily without any laws. Uh, but Shakespeare rehearsing all of uh, the worst uh, slanders uh, and staging torture, uh, as we've just seen, and at the same time allowing Caliban from the middle of that to say, this island's mine. Uh, you've taken it from me. Uh, amazing. Uh, we turn to a, now a, another direct encounter and another remarkable one uh, of these two sensibilities and has to do with the relation of, of parents and children. Uh, Montaigne wrote a set of essays on the relationship of parents and children uh, and on what happens when parents uh, grow old. He argued uh, very much against the spirit of not only his own time, but the preceding several thousand years, uh, and for that matter, much of our own time, that though parents, of course, have a natural reason, driven, as it were, instinctively, to love and take care of their children, uh, because it uh, helps this, what Montaigne calls this machine of nature forward, there's absolutely no reason to think that children, once they're grown, would have a comparable love for their parents. And in fact, it's uh, uh, stupid and vulgar on the part of parents to think uh, that children owe them anything or want to give them anything once they are launched into the world. And as you will see, uh, Montaigne argues uh, v vigorously uh, that it is a form uh, of wickedness and stupidity of parents to try to hold on uh, to their goods when their children are of age, that what they should do instead is to give things over to their children and reduce themselves to the bare minimum uh, and get on, let their children get on with it. Uh, Shakespeare, we know, read uh, this passage from Montaigne's essay of the affection of fathers to their children. Uh, we know it because, as you will see, uh, he has one of his most conniving and wicked characters, Edmund, quoted, or rather put it into a letter that, with which he's going to try to uh, turn his father, Gloucester, against legitimate, uh, his, the legitimate older son, Edgar, by attaching to Edgar, in effect, Montaigne's sentiments. Uh, and you'll see exactly how Shakespeare works this uh, with the bastard son, uh, Edmund, cleverly uh, using Montaigne's words. Of the affection of fathers to their children. There is no reason, neither is it convenient, that a gentleman of five and thirty years should give place to his son that is but twenty. For then is the father as seemly, and may as well appear and set himself forward in all manner of voyages of wars, as well by land as sea, and do his prince as good service in court or elsewhere as his son. But a father overburdened with years and crazed through sickness, and by reason of weakness and want of health, 
uh, barred from the common society of men, doth both wrong himself and injure his idly, and to no use, to hoard up and keep close a great heap of riches and deal of pelf. He is in state good enough if he be wise to have a desire to put off his clothes to go to bed. I will not say to his shirt, but to a good warm nightgown. <laughs> As for other pomp and trash whereof he hath no longer use or need, he ought willingly to distribute and bestow them amongst those to whom by natural degree they ought to belong. It is mere injustice to see an old, crazed, sinew-shrunken and nigh-dead father sitting alone in a chimney corner to enjoy so many goods as would suffice for the preferment and entertainment of many children. And in the meanwhile, for want of means, to suffer them to lose their best days and years without thrusting them into public service and knowledge of men, whereby they are often cast into despair to seek by some way, how unlawful soever, to provide for their necessaries. <laughs> Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom, and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me, for that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother? Why, bastard? Wherefore, base? When my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest, madam's issue. Why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and wake. Well, then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate, fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate. If this letter speed and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now, gods, stand up for bastards. <coughs> Kent, banished thus, and France in choler parted upon the gad. Edmund, how now? <laughs> what news? <laughs> So please, your lordship, not. <laughs> Why so earnestly you seek to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? <coughs> oh, nothing, my lord. No? What indeed needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come. If it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. <laughs> I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your overlooking. Give me the letter, sir. <laughs> I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I, I hope, for my brother's justification, he wrote this but as an essay or, or test of my virtue. This policy in reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. <coughs> Come to me, 
that of this I may speak more. If our father sleep till I waked him, you should have half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother Edgar. Ha! Huh. Conspiracy. Sleep till I waked him. You should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar, had he a hand to write this? A heart and a brain to breed it in. When, when came this to you? Who brought it? Uh, it was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I, I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? If the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. Uh, it is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Hath he never heretofore sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I... <laughs> I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at a perfect age and fathers declining, the father should be as ward to the son and the son manage his revenue. Oh, villain! Villain! His very opinion in, the, in this letter. A horrid villain. Unnatural, detested, brutish villain. Worse than brutish. Go, sirrah, seek him. I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain. Where is he? I, I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you shall run a certain course where if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for his, that he wrote this to feel my affection to your honor and to no further pretense of danger. Thank you, so. If your honor judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this, and by an auricular assurance have your satisfaction, and that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster. Nor is not sure. To his father, that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth, Edmund, seek him out. I will seek him, sir, presently. I hope you heard the sly Shakespearean joke uh, in that uh, remark uh, that uh, I think it might just be an essay or a test of my uh, <laughs> virtue, uh, he says. Uh, the, it's a remarkable uh, scene that also reaches back, as you can see from the, its beginning, to Shakespeare's rather different account of what nature is, what it is to have nature as your goddess, than what uh, Montaigne thought was the case with the happy cannibals. Uh, and it is also uh, a, a cunning reflection on Shakespeare's part, as the whole play is a cutting reflection, uh, 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 back on what I think Shakespeare must have thought was the deep, uh, foolishness of Montaigne's advice that fathers should just give their things to their children then take it back, Montaigne says, if they don't like the arrangement. You can't take it back. <laughs> okay, uh, Shakespeare and uh, Montaigne shared uh, a lifelong uh, desire to face death, to think about death. They had to, probably everyone in their age had to have something of this in them. This was a world in which uh, people died around you constantly. Uh, Montaigne had experienced the death of his older brothers, of his mother, especially of his father, whom he loved. Montaigne casually describes the death of various babies. He can't remember how many of his children have died. At one point, he says three or four. He's not quite sure. He experienced, above all, the death of his beloved friend, Etienne La Boissy. Uh, whom he watched uh, in agony at, at his end. Uh, and he himself constantly encountered the threat of death in the kidney stones that, from which he suffered his whole life and uh, from which he eventually 
died. Uh, but he is, as you will see, in the midst of this uh, constant reflection, somewhat occasionally, uh, what sounds ghoulish reflection on death, wanting to make sure you're always having a figure of death there. There's something, as always in Montaigne, oddly jaunty about uh, all of this. And this will be set against uh, a, a, an amazing scene uh, from Hamlet. Uh, a remarkable foray into the facing of death, uh, the meaning of memory, uh, the callousness of humans in the, in the graveyard trade, uh, weird humor, a fascination with decay, uh, all at the moment that Hamlet has returned from England, finds himself in the graveyard and sees uh, two grave diggers digging a grave. Uh, he doesn't know for whom, uh, but it's a grave uh, that it will you'll discover after the scene that we're about uh, to hear is for his beloved Ophelia, who's, for whose death he himself is horrifyingly responsible. That to philosophize is to learn how to die. It may happily be, as the common saying is, the time we live is worth the money we pay for it. I was born between 11 of the clock and noon, the last of February, 1533. It is but a fortnight since I was 39 years old. I want at least as much more. If in the meantime I should trouble my thoughts with a matter so far from me, it were but folly. Let us learn to stand and combat death with a resolute mind. And being to take the greatest advantage she hath upon us from her, let us take a clean, contrary way from the common. Let us remove her strangeness from her. Let us converse, frequent, and acquaint ourselves with her. Let us have nothing so much in mind as death. Let us at all times and seasons, and in the ugliest manner that may be, yea, with all faces shapen, and represent the same unto our imagination. At the stumbling of a horse, at the fall of a stone, at the least prick with a pin, let us presently ruminate and say with ourselves, what if it were death itself? And thereon let us take great heart of grace and call our wits together to confront her. Amidst our banquets, feasts, and pleasures, let us ever have this restraint or object before us, that is, the remembrance of our condition. And let not pleasure so mislead or transport us that we all together neglect or forget how many ways our joys or our feastings be subject unto death. So did the Egyptians, who in the midst of their banquetings and in the full of their greatest cheer, caused the anatomy of a dead man to be brought before them as a memorandum and warning to their guests. It is uncertain where death looks for us. Let us expect her everywhere. <laughs> the premeditation of death is a forethinking of liberty. He who hath learned to die hath unlearned to serve. In youth, when I did love, did love, me thought it was very sweet. <clears throat> To contract all the time for all my behalf. Oh, me thought there was nothing me. Has <laughs> this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave making? Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. Mm, Tis e'en so. The hand of little employment hath the daintier sense. But age with his stealing steps has clothed me in his clutch and slipped me in until the land, and if ever had never been such a hutch. Oh, <laughs> well, that skull had a tongue in it and could sing once. <laughs> now the knave jowls it to the ground as if it were Cain's jawbone that did the first murder. Might be the pate of a politician, which this ass now o'erreaches, one that would circumvent God, might it not? 
It might, my lord. Or of a courtier. This might be my lord, such a one that praised my lord, such a one's horse when he meant to beg it. Might it not? <laughs> Aye, my lord. Yeah, why even so? And now, my lady worms, chopless, and uh, knocked about the mazard with a sexton spade. Here's fine revolution, and we had the trick to see it. <laughs> a pickaxe and a spade, a spade, four and a shrouding sheet. Oh, a pit of clay for to be made for such a guest is meet. Oh, there's another. <laughs> <laughs> well, why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Where be his quiddities now? His, his quillets, his, uh, his cases, his tenures, uh, and his tricks. Uh, why, does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel and will not tell him of his action of battery? Huh. <laughs> this fellow might be in his time a, a, a great buyer of land <laughs> with his statutes, his recognizances, his fines. His double vouchers, <laughs> his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines and the recovery of his recoveries? <laughs> to have his fine pate full of fine dirt. I will speak to this fellow. Whose grave's this, Sirrah? Mine, sir. Yes. Oh, a pit of clay for it to be made for such a guest as me. I think it be thine indeed, for thou liest in it. You lie out on it, sir, and therefore it is not yours. For my part, I do not lie in it, and yet it is mine. Thou dost lie in it, to be in it, and say it is thine. It is for the dead, not for the quick. Therefore thou liest. It is a quick lie, sir. Twill away again from me to you. <laughs> <laughs> what man dost thou dig it for? For no man, sir. What woman, then? For none, neither. Who is to be buried in it? One that was a woman, sir, but rest your soul, she's dead. <laughs> How absolute the knave is. We must speak by the card, or equivocation will undo us. <laughs> How long hast thou been grave maker? Of all the days in the year, I came to it that day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was the very day that young Hamlet was born. He that is mad, that was sent into England. Aye, Mary, why was he sent into England? Why, because he was mad. He shall recover his wits there, or if you do not, it's no great matter there. <laughs> <coughs> why? Twill uh, not be seen in them there. There the men are as mad as he. Ah. How came he mad? Very strangely, they say. How strangely? Faith, even with losing his wits. <laughs> Upon what ground? Why, here in Denmark. <laughs> I have been sexton here, man and boy, 30 years. How long will a man lie in the earth ere he rot? In faith. If he be not rotten before he dies, <laughs> and we have many uh, pocky, pocky corpses nowadays that will scarce hold a laying in, he will last you some eight year or nine year. A tanner will last you nine year. Why, uh, he more than another. Why, sir, his hide is so tan with his trade that he will keep out water a great while. And your water is a great sore decayer of your horse and dead body. Here's a skull now. This skull is laid in the earth three and twenty years. Whose was it? Ah, horse and mad fellows it was. Who do you think it was? Yeah, nay, I know not. <laughs> a pestilence on him for a mad road. <laughs> I poured a flag and a rhenish on my head once. That same skull, sir, was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. <laughs> this? In that. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> Ah, lass. Poor Yorick. I knew him. Horatio. <laughs> A fellow of inf infinite jest. Of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times. And now, ah, ah, how abhorred in my Imagination it is, my gorge rises at it. 
here hung those lips, which I have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now? Your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Well, not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chop fallen. Now, get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. Astonishing glimpse at the end of that scene of the misogyny that, that uh, Hamlet has already visited upon Ophelia uh, and to prepare us for what he is about to learn. But the whole scene is so astonishing in its uh, mood swings, uh, in its peculiar conjunction of the prince and the grave diggers, the poor lower class grave diggers who actually outdo him in uh, his wordplay, uh, and in its combination of hilarity and nausea uh, that seem to have taken uh, Montaigne's desire to face death, that to philosophize is to learn to die, as Montaigne says, to take it to a place that uh, I think uh, for all of his genius Montaigne couldn't have gone, but that Shakespeare uh, somehow found himself uh, able to go. Neither. Uh, Shakespeare nor Montaigne lived the long lives uh, for which they might have hoped. We heard Montaigne just a second ago hope that he would have another 39 years, but he didn't. He died young. And Shakespeare, too, uh, it's clear from, we don't know because he didn't leave a record of the kind that Montaigne did, but it's clear from the purchases that the annuities, in effect, that Shakespeare bought in his 40s that he expected he was going to have a longer life, but he didn't. He died. Uh, also quite young. But both of them knew that might happen. Uh, Montaigne says somewhere that he wanted death, in one of his early essays, that he wanted death to uh, find him while he was planting cabbages. Didn't want it to be a grand scene. Uh, both Shakespeare and Montaigne, for all of their differences, and I hope actually one of the things that you feel is both the conversation and the deep differences between them, uh, as sensibilities, even as they converge in so many ways. But both uh, Shakespeare and Montaigne in very different ways uh, and uh, to different effects were in love with life. And the love of life uh, took the form, particularly for both of them, on a, uh, a longing, quite difficult in fact, as they both understood it was, to feel a kind of loyalty to their existence, not to reach out uh, to some other place, but as the poet Auden says uh, in one of his poems, to find the mortal world enough, to find the mortal world enough. And we will see uh, in uh, the final passages uh, for this evening, uh, two moments of uh, this articulation, one very uh, richly explicit from Montaigne's most, I, from my way of thinking, most wonderful essay, very late essay, last essay, called Of Experience, one in which he partly just tells you what he likes and doesn't like. He happens to like melons. He uh, used to like radishes and then he doesn't like them anymore. And he just uh, lists the things in a completely mad, random way that he has cared about. Uh, and then talks about what it would be what would perfection in a human being be? And it turns out perfection is not, as virtually everyone in his time would have officially said, to reach out uh, to uh, the, the divine uh, in the universe, but to be loyal to oneself. Uh, and then we'll see uh, lines that I think, as we close, that are not familiar to most of you. They're lines from a, a little known, very late play that Shakespeare wrote uh, with his, his named successor, uh, Fletcher, called Two Noble Kinsmen, uh, based on Chaucer's Knight's Tale, but lines in which uh, Duke Theseus uh, articulates what I take to be something of the same. 
uh, longing that Montaigne in his late essay also articulates. And with that, we will bring it to a close. Of experience. What egregious fools are we? But he hath passed his life in idleness, say we. Well, well, alas, I have done <coughs> nothing this day. What, have you not lived? <laughs> is it not only, well, it, it, it is not only the fundamental, but the noblest <coughs> of your occupations. Let us husband time as well as we can. Yet shall we employ much of it both idly and ill. It is an absolute perfection and, as it were, divine for a man to know how to enjoy his being loyally. We seek for other conditions because we understand not the use of ours and go out of ourselves for so much as we know not what abiding there is. We may long enough get upon stilts, for be we upon them, Yet must we go with our own legs. And we sit upon the highest throne of the world, yet sit we upon our <coughs> own tail. Oh, you heavenly charmers. What things you make of us. For what we lack, we laugh. For what we have, are sorry, still are children in some kind. Let us be thankful for that which is, and with you leave dispute that are above our question. Let's go off and bear us like the time. So let us be thankful for that which is. Uh, let us feel together the enormous gratitude that I think we should feel that two such amazing creatures lived on Earth as Montaigne <coughs> and Shakespeare. And finally, let us thank you for coming and thank our wonderful actors for. <laughs>